Welcome back. All right, so I'm going to put a bit of a spoiler alert at the start. If you haven't watched the finale of Love Island, you're not going to want to watch this because I'm going to talk about the finale and I'm going to talk about the summer that was and why I watched this stupid show. Um, and I'm not going to lie. It is one of the weirdest, like at least four times last night when I was watching the season finale, I looked over at my wife and I said, this show's really weird. Um, just there, there's so many things. And again, I've talked about this before. If we had some kind of a behind the scenes look, I would love that. I would love to see how many reshoots there are, uh, how many different times they have a camera that's in the way and they have to start over. Like, there's just, there's so many, like, they show from so many angles, but when they switch angles, you can see that the camera that was there two seconds earlier isn't there now. And there's just, there's, there's certain things that you look at and go, so how many times did they have this conversation? How many, how many times do they talk and maybe the microphone's a little bit iffy? Like, how many times does this happen? I want to know. I will never know. And for people who say, well, obviously it's fake. Well, obviously there's parts of it. Now, if you look back at previous seasons of Love Island, there are, uh, from season four, there's one couple that's still together. And from season three, there are two couples that, still, that are still together. And the couple that's still together from season four was a surprise to me because I didn't think they were going to last. So this year, it's Leo and Cassie that I'm looking at and going, that's not going to last. So... Again, spoilers for anybody who hasn't watched, but Marco and Hannah won. Now, I, I looked at the online reactions and realized I'm not in this show's demographic. To me, it was obvious Marco and Hannah won. And and it, it really depends on what you're voting for. So all summer, fans are given various chances to vote for which couple they find least compelling, least compatible. It's obvious that people just vote for which one's the most entertaining, which... I, I don't know that that's the measure of what the show is supposed to be, right? And what gets me to is that uh, Sarah Hyland at the end last night saying, and now it's time to decide, are you here for love or are you here for money? And I laughed and again turned to Yvonne and said, you get 50 grand if you choose love, so you get both. So it's not like, so at the end of it, uh, the winners, one of them's given an envelope that has nothing. One of them's given an envelope that says $100,000. And they have the option. They can keep the hundred grand for themselves or they can split it with the other person. There have been couples in the past that I have speculated if they win that, I don't think they're going to share it. I think they're going to keep the hundred grand for themselves. Marco had the hundred grand. You knew he was going to share with Hannah. I see no reason to think that it's not genuine because Marco started out with Destiny. That was a disaster. Him and Destiny did not get along. And initially, I felt like, you know, this is on Marco. Marco's an absolute jerk. Then he paired up with Hannah. I think Hannah settled him down, smoothed it out. Anything that annoyed me about Marco the first week kind of went away. Um, and by the end, yeah, I, I thought they were they were good. So if I had a chance to vote, being in the States, but I'm not. Um, I'm Canadian, so I can't have a vote anymore. We used to. They used to let Canadians vote. They don't anymore. Uh, but yeah, Marco and Hannah would have got my vote. I think I thought they were the most consistent couple, the longest couple, and they'd gone through the whole summer. In fact, when they do the Casa Amor thing, where in the middle they take all the guys and all the girls, split them up, bring in new guys and new girls for temptation. They now call them bombshells. These bombshells come in. And Marco and Hannah were never tempted, not even a little bit. Uh, if they'd been tempted at all, they would have edited something together. Closest you got was Marco's ex-girlfriend coming in. And I felt horrible for his ex-girlfriend because she's dead in the water. She's dead in the water because for the guys, um, what are you, you're not going to actually pair up with Marco's ex, are you? Like that had to be a thought process for some of these guys who might have thought, yeah, this girl's now... It was also awkward that his ex's name was Hannah and the girl he's paired up with is named Hannah as well. But I guess Hannah's a common enough name that you can overlook that. But the reality is that, you know, Marco and Hannah were the best couple. Marco was never tempted to go back to his ex-girlfriend, who was, you know, pushing pretty hard. She ended up with Mike. Mike had an exchange with Sarah Hyland, and I totally understood why he was upset. So a couple weeks back, um, when they when they decided, well, Keenan's Keenan's the one that gets voted out. And then KK said, uh, basically, she didn't want to pair up with anybody else. And KK had shown no interest really in anybody else. So she was going to leave with him. And Sarah's like, are you sure? And Mike's, Mike basically turned her and said, that's that's some mad disrespect there. Because he was good friends with Keenan, And KK deciding she wanted to leave with him. People understood. Like, they weren't, they weren't upset. But she said, are you sure? 
Now, people on the internet got mad at Mike for saying that to Sarah. But this summer, that is the only time that Sarah, when somebody said, I want to go with that person when they get eliminated because I, I'll just leave. I don't want to stay without them. Sarah never questioned anybody else. On that same episode, Jonah did the same thing with Taylor C. Where he was like, yep, yeah, I'm going. And did not say to Jonah, are you sure? She she said that though to KK about Keenan. So it definitely looked like... And I, and I really thought production did its best to make Keenan look bad. Um, did Keenan flirt with Nadja while KK was over in, in Casa Amor? Yes. Did he do anything really awful? Not really. Um, I know there was the whole, well, he shared a bed with somebody else. Yeah, and he kept pillows between them the whole night. Uh, and and the whole, well, they were, they were cuddling. I could see that happening while you're asleep. Was it the smartest move on his behalf? No, it absolutely was not. And... It's where you can see that some of these people do a really bad job of playing the game. Uh, the ones that did a good job of playing the game, Marco and Hannah, who stuck together, and Kenzo and Carmen, who miraculously are from the same town, go to the same gym, and never met one another. And this is where the internet sleuths came in and said, these two are fakes. These two are absolutely, they're lying, they're full of crap. I think part of it too was that Carmen, uh, she paired up with Victor, out of the gate when she came in. She came in a, a few days in. She was one of the first uh, newbies in there. And she paired up with Victor. And then she kind of flirted with Bergie and was kind of going to go with Bergie. And Bergie's awkward. We'll get to Bergie. And then as soon as Victor was eliminated, she turned her back on Bergie. Kenzo came in. But before Kenzo came in, she was like, well, I'm a slow burn kind of person. I really, I'm not a big fan of physical touch. And I really, I take things as slow as possible, you know? I think it's really important to slowly build up a relationship. And she talked a lot about the her religious religious beliefs and, and, and modesty and all this wonderful stuff. And then Kenzo came in and she couldn't jump on him fast enough. And by the end of the summer, they were talking about getting married. They're only here for 32 days. They knew each other for like three weeks. And he was like, I should have brought a wedding ring. And she's like, I can see us having kids together. So this this didn't add up to people. And for Kenzo, he never looked at anybody else but Carmen. Carmen never looked at anybody else but him once he was in there. And so the speculation on the internet is, because that's what you have on the internet, is that she was killing time until Kenzo got in there. She was messing around here, messing around there, and she might kiss this guy or that guy. But she never really did anything beyond like a little chicken pack kiss here and that nothing. And then Kenzo came in and it's just, marry me. So that's why the internet got really suspicious. Plus, yeah, they're both from Scottsdale, Arizona, which I understand is a big city, but they belong to the same gym and they're in the same age range and odds are they've probably met in passing. So the fact that there was no mention of that, other than, hey, we're from the same place, it, it led to people being suspicious and the fact that her whole body language, the way she was, changed too. Um, so I, I'll talk about this relationship. We'll come back to it. Bergie and Taylor S., Bergie spent the whole summer by himself, even though you see he was with Anna and then he was with Cassie. When he was paired up with Cassie, Cassie let him cuddle her, which doesn't mean anything. Like, it's not a big deal. Uh, the ladies were trying to get Bergie used to being around women and getting him used to talking to women and being friends with women because he's very awkward around them. Uh, so, like, clearly being as, as innocent as he was and as inexperienced as he was, it made him different. And it, I think it endeared the audience to him. And so when Taylor S. came in, and Taylor S. comes, comes in on day 21, and she ended up with Bergie, initially it was kind of, he was the only single guy in the villa. He was it. And I think it likely would have gone around that Bergie was quite popular. Whenever they had a voting situation, Bergie would usually finish at the top. Uh, if it was for popularity and if it was weeding out unpopular people, he wouldn't even have to go up for, for any kind of elimination. So the internet sleuths again have decided that Taylor S. was with Bergie for game reasons. And you know what? I'm fine with that. And I'm, I'm saying that because it is a game. You're trying to win $100,000. Uh, I also saw somebody edit together um, a GIF from last night where Bergie kisses Taylor and she looks away and she looks kind of like disgusted that they didn't win it, but I really didn't see that from them during that episode. And I think the internet's decided she doesn't actually like him. And for Bergie, any girl that would give him the time of day, he was very interested in. 
Uh, I think Imani felt that she missed out with Bergie as well. She tried to pivot back to Bergie late, but Bergie had already got his, his eyes set on Taylor S. I will say for Bergie, he really wasn't tempted. But it was funny because uh, as soon as Imani comes over, like, hey, I, I wouldn't mind pairing up with you. He was he was floored. And I laughed and I, again, said to Yvonne, he has never been in this situation. He has never had two beautiful women express interest in him at the same time. This will likely never happen again the rest of his life outside of the celebrity he gains from Love Island. As brief as that's going to be, it's your 15 minutes of fame. So this this is a situation he's not he's not anywhere near ready to deal with. He and he wasn't, and he just he looked like a deer caught in headlights. Uh, but he did stay with Taylor, and he did not decide to go with Imani. So before these four are your final four couples, and again, I'll come back to Kenzo and Carmen because there's some things I want to talk about with a couple of these couples. Uh, Kyle and Destiny ended up together. I thought they seemed perfectly fine and compatible at the end, but all the tension went out of the game once they realized, so we're winding down. There's no other new people coming in. We've already gone through the last coupling, so we're good. And all the tension went out of the villa at that point. So yeah, I, it's easy to get along with everybody and, and to be cool and calm and relaxed, when you're done playing the game. The gameplay is basically done at that point. Uh, Jonah and Taylor C, I think they have a really good chance in the real world. They just, it worked. Every scene they had of the two of them together, they just, they get along. It just, it clicks. This is another one that if you told me, actually, they knew each other before the show, I'd say, yeah, that tracks. Uh, these two just had this natural chemistry, which I've had that experience. I know Yvonne and I, within weeks of knowing each other, even with my ex, couple weeks after my ex and I had started dating, there were people who were like, you guys are like, you've been together forever. So I've had that experience where it just, it works initially out of the gate. And so all the best to them. And they, they both seem great. Like Taylor C of, of all of the young ladies in here, I thought she was one of the most entertaining and funniest. Uh, and then you get to Scott and Johnny. Now I felt awful for Johnny. I, I did. It felt like Johnny was always the backup plan for everybody. Scott was the first one that came in, and she was the the first one that he had his eye on. Um, Johnny, probably the most beautiful of the women on the show, and I thought she was really well-spoken, too. And this is where one thing that's interesting with Love Island, to me anyways, is that the originals will pick the originals. The originals will stay with the originals. And for viewers, when somebody comes in late, as Scott and Johnny did, they have no chance of winning. You have none. So to me, like if, you know, if, if, if they are, oh, we're going to cast you on, on a dating show, or we're going to cast you on this show. All right. Am I one of the originals or am I going to come in halfway through the season? Well, you'll come in later. Okay. So I have no chance of winning this then because people build up this, this attachment to the couples that have been there for a while. And so when Scott and Johnny paired up and I have no reason to think that they weren't genuinely interested in each other, uh, that yeah, the public's not going to vote for them. It's just not going to happen. And so Yvonne and I were able to correctly identify who was going to get eliminated when each week. Uh, like Zay and Imani getting eliminated because people felt like they didn't have enough chemistry with one another. Which I guess made sense. They'd been together for like 24 hours. The show is is odd that they'll be like, all right, now we want the, the people in the villa to vote on which couples need to go. And it's there to start a fight. So I've seen online people saying, I wish it was the way it used to be, which was you'd have one extra girl or one extra guy every week, and then you knew somebody was getting eliminated. But when you make it so that the Islanders are eliminating each other, it means that you're going to have votes for people who don't go home, and you're going to have fights after. And this show, way more than previous seasons, was edited and put together to cause fights. They had video footage of people screwing around, and they would show it to other people, and they would make sure that all this footage got got shared and that all of this mistrust and dislike was there. And also, they would make sure that the American public saw it because to me it felt like they were trying to manipulate who you voted for and who you didn't vote for, right? And that's where I thought Keenan got done dirty. I really thought Keenan... Um, there were a lot of times during the show that I didn't understand what the hell he was talking about because full sentences were, were a struggle at times. He would say, or he'd string together all these words and I'd look at him on and go, well, that was kind of a sentence. And she'd be like, yeah, I'm not sure it made any sense. And he's, he's not the only one. There are definitely people who will say, like there were times Carmen would go on this whole diatribe. And when she was done with the whole thing, I, I'd say out loud, well, that was, that was almost a coherent argument. That was, uh, it was interesting. She's, um, 
All right. That is interesting. So there's there's definitely people that'll you can tell that I, I don't know if this is because they know they're on TV. I do think that they get coached that okay, now you guys have to go talk about your feelings. Yeah. Like my okay, my favorite moment last night where I started swearing about how weird it was, is they had to go under this this weird arch. I think it was a heart shaped arch for their declarations of love. Well, what if you don't want to declare your love? What if <laughs> What? What if? What if somebody you've just met two weeks ago you don't feel like declaring your love for because you don't know yet? And it's so weird to me how when a person on a show like this says, "I don't know if I'm in love with this person. I just met them." Other cast members and people watching on TV are like, "I don't think they're there for the right reasons." Now, I don't. I don't take them seriously. I don't think they're taking this whole thing seriously. They are taking it seriously. That's why they're looking going, I can't declare my love for that person. I just met them. But it's, it's funny to me because, yeah, 32 days they're there. That's it. And declare your love. It's It's been a month. It's it's like hockey season hasn't even started yet. We we didn't even we didn't play a hockey game. At, like, it just, I can measure everything hockey, right? But yeah, it was just, it was weird to me, this declaration of love. And, and I said to Yvonne, I said, so there's there's got to be somebody out of these eight people declaring their love that doesn't really feel that they love the person. They like them. But anyways, so there's Love Island Games coming uh, this fall. It's filming in October. It premieres November 1st. They haven't told us much about it other than it's going to feature cast members from the U.S. version, the U.K. version, the Australian version. It's going to have a UK host and it's going to have the UK and a voiceover announcer who I have never found funny, not even once. And I'm saying that all honesty, never once. Uh, Matthew, who did the voiceover for the first three seasons of USA or Love Island USA, absolutely hilarious. I laughed every time he spoke. He was absolutely great. Uh, the, the guy they have now, and again, he does the voiceover too for uh, UK. I, I don't I don't find him funny at all. I, I just don't. And there's a lot of times where he'll say something and I'll be like, that was really mean, actually. He's framing it as a joke, but that's that's mean. Like every two seconds mentioning that Bergie works at Dairy Queen. Oh, okay, but he's also, he's a manager. He's been there 10 years. He probably makes good money. So, and, and I, I guarantee he makes good money. I'm, I'm going to say that right now. You can make good money at fast food if you're there for a while. So there were 33 contestants overall, which shows how ridiculous this show gets with just piling people and people, and then you end up narrowing it down to eight. But for the people who come in halfway through, you're you're hosed. It's like it's a curse of Casa Amor. You bring in these new people, but everybody's already coupled up. And this year, everybody was coupled up way more than they were before. So there were two couples that went through a lot of scrutiny. Um, Kenzo and Carmen, I think, you know, they finished fourth. So this is fourth, third, second, first. Uh, they finished fourth. I don't think it was just because people suspect they know each other in the real world prior to coming into this. Uh, there was a competition they had, which was you have to get the heart rate of the opposite sex up doing some weird strip tease thing, but they're not really strip teasing and they're still wearing more than they do when they're around the villa during the day. It was weird, but so the girls come out, dance for the guys. Guys come out, dance for the girls. And you're trying to see who can get the other other side's heart rate up. And it was a, a guys versus girls situation. So Carmen, who's paired up with Kenzo, she comes out. She dances up on the guys. She doesn't make out with anybody. She doesn't do anything anywhere near as over the top as some of the other girls. But Kenzo got really upset with her. Kenzo got really upset with her, even though she saved him for last. She made out with him. She was clearly with him. He got mad at her because she danced with any of the other guys. And then when it was his turn, he came out and he's like, I only, I'm only here for one person. And he went over and he kissed Carmen and he left. And all the other girls are like, what was that? This is a competition. We're just playing around. Everybody's giving everybody lap dances. And so he pouted. Uh, Carmen ends up crying. She ends up, you know, t talking about him being jealous and possessive. And he just kind of is like, well, and this is what got me was he's like, well, you don't have to do the same things that I do. You're free to do whatever you want. But I didn't feel comfortable dancing on people like that. I didn't feel that it was right for our relationship for me to do that. So that is a very, very manipulative thing to say to a person. Oh, you can do whatever you... It's fine, sweetie. If you want to ruin our relationship and kill me, that's... No, it's okay. I mean, you're murdering me inside. My heart is dead now. But it's okay. Enjoy yourself. I have experienced that. 
I remember uh, one one example I would use just out of my own life is that I uh, my my dad could absolutely do do that kind of thing where you would ask something and be like sure it's gonna be like does any there was one night that he says does anybody want uh, any any more um, I'm trying to remember if it was chicken wings or what it was and I just said well yeah I'll have one and he goes here you go it's the last one enjoy it eat up I guess I don't have to eat so rather than just saying <laughs> so again you know that's that whole well, I mean, for me, it just, oh, I just, but it just, the, the body language reminded me of that. It's, it's controlling and it's something that Carmen was like, well, I've had problems with guys like that before. Yeah. And this is in a controlled environment where you know everybody. He knows all these people. And all I could picture after that was she'll be out in public. Some guy will walk up to her. Hey, I loved you on Love Island. She'll be like, thank you so much. You know, and maybe he, he gives her like this little, like, little arm shoulder hug barely anything or nothing and ken's like well who's that why'd you hug him what was that about yeah you really like this don't you and that's just that's that's what i picture in my head and so yeah from that moment on i was like i i don't like this couple uh i don't know if leo can stay faithful to cassie and i say this because as long as he can see cassie he is very very abundantly in love with her and faithful to her and as soon as she was over in Casa Amor and Johnny walked in, he was like, hey, who's this Johnny girl? And he was telling her a lot of the same things he told Cassie prior. And then when Cassie came back, he immediately repented. And, oh, no, 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 I could never, I, I have no interest in Johnny, threw Johnny under the bus. Cassie then showed an interest in Johnny, and she threw Johnny under the bus. As I said, poor Johnny, nobody made her first pick. And they end up back together. So... Because they're also, I think Cassie's 22 and Leo's 21, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I just get the feeling that at some point in time, they're going to be separated uh, in, in some physical way. And I, I don't know if another woman gives Leo, you know, a glance, gives him the time of day. I don't know if Leo's going to be able to say, well, no, no, I'm, I'm with Cassie. I just don't know that I buy that. I, I don't know that I buy that. Uh, Marco and Hannah, I'd be very surprised if they don't get married, to be honest. I think that it just, it just works. Uh, yes, again, that would have been my vote, uh, for, for best couple, but my second place vote would have gone to Bergie and Taylor S because I thought there was, while it was a little bit odd, and of course, Bergie's grandfather then totally submarined their chances of winning, I thought, by saying everything looked forced to him. So for anybody watching, it'd be, yeah, you know, I hadn't thought of that. Or there were people who already had that opinion as well. Uh, I hope they make it. I really do. I hope they make it. But yeah, I, I couldn't have voted Leo and Cassie. But this is where I feel like my view of who should win flies in the face of a lot of others. There were people who said Leo and Cassie should win because Cassie was the most entertaining. Not going to argue with that. Uh, they argued about how beautiful Cassie is, which, okay. And that they had the most drama, so they were the most entertaining, so they should have won. Well, no. Because um, to me, Love Island is, so which couple do you think is most compatible? Which which couple do you think has the best chance of making it? Which, again, to me, would be Marco and Hannah. Um, Kenzo and Carmen, I think if they didn't, if they weren't from the same town, if there had been some, something that tested them along the way, and there really wasn't, maybe they would have got more votes. But... Yeah, I, I couldn't have voted for Leo and Cassie. But that's just me. That's just me. And it was it was interesting. Uh, Mattia's not on the board, but it was interesting to see Mattia because I'd seen him on uh, Bachelor in Paradise Canada. He came across a lot better, I thought, on this show than he did Bachelor in Paradise Canada. My theory is that he, he saw himself on Bachelor in Paradise Canada and said, um, I, I have to watch that I'm, I'm fitting in. So on the Canadian Bachelor in Paradise Canada, well, Bachelor in Paradise Canada, you don't have to see Canadian version because obviously it's a Canadian version, Shannon. But on the on the Bachelor in Paradise Canada, uh, he was very much on his own. He really didn't talk to other people. At least that's how it was edited for TV. And there was a lot of talk about, yeah, he doesn't really have a personality. And I think Mattia was much better this time. I saw people saying he was boring, but maybe they just thought he was boring because he just didn't want to get involved in the drama at all. He paired up with Cassie, and then when Cassie, it was clear she was looking at Leo, he had an interest in Johnny. Johnny had to choose between Scott and Mattia, and she picked Scott. Now, if she had picked Mattia, it might have given her a better chance of sticking around on the show. I think Mattia would have drawn more votes than Scott did. And this is where the gameplay part of it shows up, right? Get in a couple, stay in a couple, 
and show that you're loyal and, and say all the right things at the right time and you've got a chance to win $100,000. But in the end, these people always seem to pick love. Although again, as I said, uh, the money's involved. Plus, you have to think about it from a devil's advocate point of view too. So these people are all going to get their 15 minutes of fame, right? So let's just say Marco gets that $100,000 last night and says, you know what, I'm just, I'm, I'm keeping this. Hannah was great, but I like $100,000. He would cost himself followers, he would become reviled amongst reality TV voters, and might lose more money later for other reality TV shows he could appear on, because this is clearly now a cottage industry where people are appearing on multiple different shows and and trying to find love, money. But, you know, if Marco had kept that full $100,000, he's probably costing himself more money later. So, even if... Let's just say devil's advocate. Even if Hannah was was fun, she was, you know, summer fling and he's not going to keep her around, you still give her that 50 grand because you know that later on you're seen as like a generous person, a sharing person, and you can end up on other reality shows and people will like you. And so that's part of it is that that public uh, persona that you have through reality TV. And it's just so weird. There's so many things with this show that are just bizarre. The music, the music is awful. And they always have like, oh, scan this barcode now and it'll open up Spotify and you can you can play the Love Island playlist. Are you kidding me? Are you, is anybody, what, like they just, they murder so many songs. They take every song from the 80s and they slow it right down. It's to the point where Yvonne and I even make fun of it. We'll, we'll like pick some really heavy metal song we listen to and try to sing along in a really slow, melodic, romantic version of it because it's so stupid. It's just so dumb. Or it's just, it's also guilty of, of having lyrics at times and I'm like, are you guys sure you guys should be playing that song over this part? Because it's distracting right now because the lyrics really don't match up. And it's really weird. And uh, the music's really loud. And you guys might want to just cut it out. But it is something we've noticed with reality TV. The music never stops. Ever. Uh, whether it's a, a Ramsey show. Um, Bar Rescue, I think it stops at times. But Bar Rescue is a little different with reality TV. And uh, yeah, on dating shows, the music never ends. Never. It's just this endless melodic music that they pretend is music, but it, it can't be. It just... <laughs> It can't be. It can't be real music. It has to be just music that just an AI spit out and that's their soundtrack because it's just so generic and mostly hideous, horrible covers. So if you don't like reality TV and you're like, well, why should I watch? I don't know if that's a selling point or not, but it's definitely entertaining to me. When I hear the first few bars of a song and I'm like, Oh, not that. Like last night, it was Right Here Waiting by Richard Marks, which in all reality, I think it's that they listened to uh, my wife and I in the van. That was on uh, when we were going to the last meetup in Coquitlam, and we sang along with it. We sang along with the whole song. And uh, so I think the Love Island crew was like, let's ruin that for them, and we'll do it in the finale. Let's ruin it. So it was a, it's a good job. Uh, I was a big Richard Marks fan in the 80s. I just thought he was great. Anyways, there you go. Uh, my look at uh, 28 and a half minutes of me looking at the show that is just ridiculous. And we'll see what Love Island Games means. I'm hoping fire's involved. I'm hoping they have to, like, you know, drive dune buggies and, and jump 800 feet in the air over some kind of a chasm. I'm going to be very disappointed, aren't I? Um, I? I don't want it to be just, like, making out and gross games with food because they baby bird each other food. Who decides that's anyway? That's a whole. That's a whole other. Anyway, <laughs> there's there's times they have they have these these competitions. They don't mean anything. They don't win anything. And uh, Yvonne and are just like, let's just fast forward through this. This is just going to make me puke. Anyways, there you go. Uh, so there's another reason to watch the show or not watch the show. Thank you guys so much for all your support as always. Thank you for helping this channel get past 26,500 subscribers. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.